Welcome to a world where nothing is quite as it seems. Welcome to fake Britain. Here at the fake Britain house, we'll reveal the fakes that are flooding the market, conning people like you and me, and making money for the criminals. We'll investigate the fraudsters who are selling us something that isn't real and could be dangerous. And we'll help you avoid falling for a fake. Today on Fake Britain, police crack open a counterfeit champagne case where the fakers are making a killing. We think there's probably about 33,000 uh, there in that bag. We're given one of the most advanced fake £2 coins ever from the one place you'd never expect, a high street bank. It's certainly the best £2 counterfeit that I've seen. The fake chairs putting child safety at risk. I feel sick to my stomach that that's in my house. And the fake carbon monoxide detectors that could cost you your life. The claims of compliance with the standard, in this instance, with these particular products, is fake. Britain is the world's largest export market for champagne. Each year we consume around 30 million bottles of the stuff. It's big business. And the fakers are desperate to get their share of the fizz in this lucrative market. So, not surprising then that the police, revenue and customs, trading standards and even Europol mounted a joint operation to crack down on the burgeoning champagne fakery. But even they were surprised at what they found. It's daybreak. OK, guys, can I have your attention, please? Detective Inspector Simon Harsley from the South East Regional Organised Crime Unit is here to talk champagne. All this stuff's been smuggled in, it runs into millions of pounds that are owed to uh, revenue and customs. They're planning a dawn raid on a wholesaler that's trading in fake bubbly. We hope to find some counterfeit alcohol and uh, a quantity of alcohol that's duty evaded, i.e. smuggled into the country. Briefing over, now it's time to get going. Can I task you with getting some uh, prisoner transport to Team 3? Team 3, please. Just ahead of Simon, his team are swooping on three separate locations connected to the business. We're executing the warrants now at two warehouse locations, so we're looking to secure the warehouses and really see what we've got there and uh, contain everything. So it's a question of getting in there quickly so no evidence is uh, destroyed. First up, Simon arrives at the main warehouse and business premises. The owner isn't here, but police suspect some of his employees could be illegal immigrants. After questioning, one of them is arrested on suspicion of immigration offences. <laughs> a quick update, we've obviously gained entry. Pretty sparse, really, not much there, as far as I can see. So, not much by the way of champagne although the team soon discovers wine by the caseload. And they suspect this has been smuggled in without the duty being paid. But there's soon another surprise. There's a whole horde of other fake or illegal goods uncovered by trading standards. Generators, chainsaws, angle grinders, even a couple of compactors to tarmac the drive. The machinery, you can see, doesn't fit the British standard. There's no instructions. This machinery shouldn't be in this country and being sold on the open market. I think potentially it's dangerous, so that's why it's been taken out of here. And these fakers certainly aren't whiter than white. Counterfeit washing powder also seems high on the for sale list. It's a, quite a common occurrence, uh, washing powder being quite expensive in this country, that the leading brands are actually uh, faked uh, abroad and then um, imported. And it doesn't stop there. As well as chainsaws, trading standards uncover power drills that don't appear to meet European standards. 
all of these products potentially putting British customers in danger. There's another surprise in store for Simon's team, and it still isn't bubbly. OK, what we've just got out of the safe is uh, quite an amount of cash, as you can see, that we've uh, seized, and um, that'll be coming with us uh, back to the police station. We haven't counted it, so it's difficult to estimate what it is, uh, but you can see they're, they're neatly bundled up. We think there's probably about 33,000 uh, there in that bag, and uh, that's been seized, and we're taking that away with us. So a big blow for the fakers, and it gets worse for them. The director of the company has been arrested at his home address. That's where lead officer D.I. Harsley is heading now, as his team has made an intriguing discovery. I'm getting some messages that there's a slightly strange scenario there in that the, there is a, a shop or something very similar that's accessed via his back garden. Um, I believe some trading standards officers have an interest in this and I just need to see what the situation is. D.I. Harsley arrives to oversee the search of the home and the nearby shop. Yeah, I'm at the front door. Can you let me in, please? The fake champagne the team have been looking for could be hidden in here. I've just been inside the uh, home address. Um, we've got a very unusual scenario. We've got an alcohol store next door, which actually feeds uh, an off-licence, the frontage of which goes on to an entirely different street. Um, we clearly want to um, have a look in the off-licence. Uh, we clearly want to have a look in the alcohol store. Uh, the search has commenced. And it's in the alcohol store that Simon's team have finally found what they're looking for. Bottles of fake and duty-evaded champagne. That's good news for the investigators here from Europol. They've been tracking counterfeit champagne across Europe, and they suspect these fakes may have links to an organised crime group in Italy. The main suspect has been ordering the fake champagne from Italy. It's processed by an organised crime group located in Italy, manufacturing and selling the bottles. They were really like, yeah, production sites. They were manufacturing the uh, labels, the corks, everything, so that the bottle can really look identical to uh, the genuine one. And these show the telltale signs of being fake. The labelling and the branding don't seem consistent with the genuine product. So um, that's coming with us and we'll, we'll look to get that tested and look for an expert opinion on, on that. It's not only fake champagne on offer here that could pose a risk to public health. Bottles of counterfeit vodka are also taken away. But there are more places to search. The police know of another warehouse down the road that's used by the business. And when they get there, they find more than 135 pallets of smuggled alcohol, including fake vodka. This is what over £200,000 of duty and VAT evasion looks like. And Simon spotted the signs of duty evasion on the labelling. There's a bottle of vodka here with a label on it. This alcohol is destined for a market outside the UK, therefore no duty has been paid on it. Um, what is happening is that the uh, label is peeled off, and an example of that has been found within the warehouse, and a counterfeit uh, label has been placed on the bottle to indicate that the UK duty has been paid, which is intended to deceive, of course. Uh, we know that that is a counterfeit label. You've got some um, whiskies as well. You've got a uh, similar scenario, and, and with many of the bottles, you can actually see the sticky of the uh, original label outside the parameter of the label that's been put on there. But even sophisticated fakers with links to organised crime can slip up. Looking at the label, I'm not even sure that's placed on the bottle uh, straight, but uh, that is a counterfeit label that we can tell from the markings there. But to seize all of these pallets of duty-evaded alcohol, the team will need help by the lorry load. The entire contents of the warehouse have been seized by Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, and, of course, the police will look into the counterfeiting side uh, and, and any counterfeit labels, uh, anything that's been sold that's a counterfeit product, and actually look at what's being sold to the general public. So, yeah, good day. And so the first of six 40-foot HGVs carrying the seized alcohol sets off. 
It's another win in the battle against the fakers. The company was later wound up with debts of around £8 million in unpaid taxes to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Coming up, we reveal the sophisticated fake £2 coin that came from a high street bank. It's good enough to fool the public and concern the experts. If experts are having difficulty, consumer have got no hope of being able to tell the difference. It's a normal £2 coin, isn't it? Every year, around 50 people lose their lives to carbon monoxide poisoning. The gas can be released from appliances like a faulty cooker, boiler or wood-burning stove, but you can't see it or smell it. It's known as the silent killer. These devices should protect you and your home, carbon monoxide detectors, and these ones claim to meet the European standard, but their claims are fake. Rely on one of these to protect you, and you could be putting your life at risk. Every year, 4,000 people end up in hospital with carbon monoxide poisoning. Around 40 of those people die. With rising awareness of the dangers, more of us are buying carbon monoxide detectors to protect ourselves from the deadly gas. But the fakers know there's profit to be made in safety devices. They're selling carbon monoxide detectors carrying fake safety claims that could put lives in danger. Gordon Samuel discovered the importance of these detectors soon after his daughter Katie got married. She was hugely popular. She was hugely attractive and pretty. Um, and she was very intelligent. She was just the most wonderful daughter. She was very, very happy in her job. And it was the beginning of married life. One evening, Katie decided to run a bath. When her husband arrived home from work, he noticed something wasn't right. When he rang the bell and she didn't answer, uh, he became quite concerned and uh, opened the door with his key. And he saw that the cat was um, unconscious um, in the kitchen. And he called for her and she didn't answer. And um, he rushed into the bathroom and he had found that she had been overcome by very, very lethal carbon monoxide fumes. Without Katie's knowledge, her boiler had been leaking lethal levels of carbon monoxide. A young doctor came into the room and said, I'm really sorry. And it was just one of those moments in life that you just don't want to remember. To say that I miss it now is just um, a huge understatement. I mean, I just, I can't articulate how much we miss her. Katie had died just weeks after her wedding day. It later transpired that she did in fact have a carbon monoxide detector, but it had been left unopened in its packet. If they had known, they would have activated the alarm. And if the alarm had sounded and she was, and they, all of us, were aware of what carbon monoxide was, she would have had a chance. She would probably have lived. Gordon went on to set up a charity in Katie's name, campaigning for all homes to have a carbon monoxide detector installed by law. The fakers know there's profit to be made out of safety-conscious consumers. Fake Britain has discovered that detectors are being sold online that could be dangerous. We decided to buy several detectors that were advertised as meeting European safety standards. We then sent them for testing at BSI, the British Standards Institution. Expert Graham McKay thinks that the dangers of carbon monoxide are closer to home than we might think. Many, many combustion appliances have the capability to produce carbon monoxide if they're not adjusted properly or installed properly. It kills somewhere in the region of 25 to 50 people a year in the UK. It's very hard to diagnose because the symptoms in mild cases are very often confused with a cold or the flu. 
The detectors we bought were advertised as meeting European safety standards. But at first glance, Graham's concerned. The product itself doesn't contain any of the warnings or information that the standard requires. It doesn't even tell me the name of the manufacturer. It doesn't have, crucially, the end-of-life information. Carbon monoxide alarms have sensors that have finite lives, so it's important that you know when to replace it. They won't last forever. Graham's also unimpressed by the incorrect advice given in the instructions. It tells you not to install in kitchens. Kitchens are probably the biggest source of carbon monoxide producing appliances in the UK, from cookers, uh, boilers, water heaters. They are typically in, in kitchens. When a genuine carbon monoxide detector goes off for the first time after detecting high levels of the gas, its job isn't over. The detector must continue working and go on to detect further leaks in the future in order to pass the European standard. Graham needs to see if these are genuine detectors. So he'll simulate a catastrophic carbon monoxide leak from a boiler. This test mimics a scenario whereby maybe you have a, a, a release of a high level of carbon monoxide into your home. Your alarm will detect that and go off, which is great. You'll then ventilate the space and, and take other preventative action. Eventually, you'll go back into that space thinking, well, maybe everything's OK, and, and you need your alarm to operate again. First, the detectors are exposed to a dangerously high level of carbon monoxide, 5,000 parts per million, enough to render a person unconscious and kill them within minutes. So far, so good. The detectors have passed the first part of the test. But if their safety claims are fake, the sensors inside these detectors could actually be of poor quality. Some cheaper sensors can be physically damaged. They can be, they can be poisoned, effectively, by these very high levels. If the alarm has been damaged, then you could be putting yourself at risk unwittingly because your alarm is no longer functioning. The detectors are rested. Then they're exposed to carbon monoxide at lower levels. It's time to see whether they will pass the European standard by going on to detect the silent killer gas once again, having already done so. They'll have to detect the gas and sound their alarms within 90 minutes. 90 minutes later and counting, they failed to respond. Two of the alarms didn't respond at all, uh, and one of the alarms has entered an erratic error mode where it beeps occasionally, but it's not going into a full alarm mode because it's not beeping continuously. The conclusion is that the high dose of CO has actually damaged them and affected their ability to accurately detect the gas. The performance of every carbon monoxide detector bought by Fake Britain was found to be unpredictable. The claims of compliance with the standard, in this instance with these particular products, is fake. They don't comply, and they obviously don't comply. We showed our findings to Gordon Samuel, who lost his daughter to carbon monoxide poisoning. It's very, very uh, upsetting that these are finding their way onto the market. These fake carbon monoxide detectors cost us about £10 each. Campaigners like Gordon say that by spending just £10 or £20 more, customers can buy a reliable detector that they can really trust. You should be buying properly branded alarms, alarms that are compliant, alarms that come from reliable sources. You're putting your life at risk and you're putting your, your loved one's lives at risk. And you'd be a fool to, to buy something like this when um, the real thing's available and it could save your life. Take a look at these. Yes, two two pound coins. First made by the Royal Mint back in 1998. There are two different metal components. So it's complicated to manufacture and very difficult to counterfeit. The problem is, this one wasn't made by the Royal Mint. It was made by a faker. A leading expert has told us it's the best he's ever seen. So how many are out there? Who's making them? And could you tell the difference? Previously on Fake Britain, we've seen huge hordes of fake coins. Here, police were raiding the premises of criminals, churning out one-pound fakes. Coin bags, loads. An estimated one in 30 one-pound coins is fake. 
the Royal Mint is so concerned, they'll soon be introducing this new 12-sided pound coin to combat the counterfeiters. But now the fakers are turning their attention to the two-pound coin. And that's a problem for Andy Brown. His company services coin-operated machines across the country. In the last year, he's seen an increase in the number and quality of the new two-pound fakes. It's a far cry from how the coin fakers started out. So this was one of the early fakes that we, we found, which is really just a lump of lead tin alloy and then spraying it gold to make it look like a genuine coin. That was then. Now fake two-pound coins are getting much closer to the genuine article. The fakes have got much better. They can now be accepted in some of the vending machines and car park machines that are out in the field. For us, the concern is to try and stop the fakers before they really start getting going. Today, Fake Britain has asked Andy to see if he can find any of the latest fake two-pound coins in circulation. He's going to his local bank to withdraw two and a half thousand pounds worth of two-pound coins. He expects to find some fakes amongst all 1,250 of them. We're going to uh, put them through the coin validator to see if any of them get rejected, and then we can check to see whether they're counterfeits. This coin validator is identical to anything you'd find inside a ticket or vending machine. It takes 16 different measurements of the coin, including its width and weight, to work out if it's genuine or not. Any coin outside the validator gets rejected out of a different slot and generally would be returned back to the customer if he was putting it in the machine. None of the coins from the bank have been rejected by the validator, but Andy knows that the latest fakes are good enough to beat the machine. So using his experience and a keen eye, he and a colleague sift through the coins to try and find anything unusual. Halfway through the batch, Andy spots something out of the ordinary. We've discovered a coin that looks a bit different to all the rest. It's a 2011, which is one of the years that we've got a number of counterfeit coins for already. This may look convincing, but there's a simple test to tell the fake from the real thing. If we go to a genuine coin, one of the quick and easiest tests to discover whether a coin is counterfeit is to, to hold it up with a two pound at the top and a date at the bottom, and then spin the coin on its axis, and the queen's head should be facing upwards. What we would call 12 o'clock, and on the fake, when we turn the head round, it's more like it's at three o'clock. So that one is definitely a counterfeit coin. But it's only by using a microscope that Andy can uncover the signature markings of a fake. Now I've got the counterfeit and a genuine coin side by side, and we're just checking the rim inscription to see what difference there is there and straight away when we look at the mint marks the one on the bottom is a genuine coin you can see the nice mint mark which looks really well stamped and the one on the top is the counterfeit with the poor mint mark and as we go around the edge lettering is all totally different the text is very poorly done particularly the letter s is a very distinctive letter on on this counterfeit and the a's which has got like a circle in the center of it Next, Andy takes his find downstairs for computer analysis to have a more detailed look at the properties of the fake two-pound coin. Here, yeah, Chris, I'd like to try and calibrate that one for us. Here, he can measure the probability of the coin beating a vending machine in the outside world. And there's no stopping this two-pound fake. It beats the coin validator again and again, 30 times out of 30 and beyond. So we've now inserted the coin over 100 times and we've still got a 100% acceptance rate. Even genuine coins get rejected now and then due to their imperfections. But it seems this fake could be better than the real thing. We would expect a genuine coin to have something like a 95% acceptance rate. So it's quite concerning that we've got a counterfeit coin that's given us a 100% acceptance rate. Worry, the performance of the fake he's found today could have much wider implications for Britain's coinage. Some vending operators deposit their money into a bank via a cash centre, so if this coin can be accepted by a validator, it would generally be accepted as a genuine coin in a sorting machine, so they won't be able to take them out of circulation. 
It's thought that there are hundreds of thousands of fake two pound coins in circulation. But with the latest fakes able to fool a machine, can they also fool consumers? It's a normal two pound coin, isn't it? What do I make of it? It looks a genuine article, the normal two pound coin. If you're um, walking the streets and you're exchanging this very quickly, you wouldn't know the difference. Well, it's the same weight, I think. If someone came in and gave me this as a two pound, I think it was an actual two pound and, and accept it, yeah. Yeah, this is dangerous, actually. <laughs> Fake Britain wanted to know what the experts make of the new high-end £2 fakes. We arranged for Andy to take it to the Goldsmiths Company, an assay office in the heart of London that's tested and hallmarked precious metals for nearly seven centuries. Every year they check and approve a selection of Britain's coinage. Goldsmiths Dave Merry is here to analyse Andy's fake £2 coin. Been a busy man by the look of it. We have, yes. So this is one we found last week, which is of a much better quality. Yeah. And been no. accepted by most of the vending machines. Blimmin' hell, yeah, you can see why on that. Dave Merry's immediately impressed by the look of the coin. But you can also tell a lot about a coin by how much it weighs. So Dave puts the fake two-pound coin to the test using his scales. The Royal Mint's published weight for a genuine £2 coin is 12 grams. Um, and we've just weighed the counterfeit one, and again, we're getting a reading of 12 grams. It's remarkably close to a genuine Royal Mint coin. The weight of the fake £2 coin matches that of a real one, but Dave wants to know exactly what the fake is made of, and to do that, he'll have to X-ray it. The great thing about this bit of kit is it will give you a readout and percentages of actually all those different elements that go to make up a coin. A genuine £2 coin is bimetallic, meaning it's made up of two different copper-nickel alloy metals. This makes the outer rim gold and the inner part bright silver. The bimetallic feature was introduced by the Royal Mint to make it harder for the fakers to copy coins. First, Dave shows us the composition of the inner part of the genuine coin. It's just over 70% copper and nearly 30% nickel. Now, how about the composition of the fake? And we can see straight away we've got 68% copper, 31% nickel, um, and there's a trace element of iron in there. This is a very good fake. The figures look... Um, much more closer than I've seen previously for other fake coins. That sort of coincides with what we've seen with the validators, really, where it's being accepted by some of the validators, so right, okay. it would seem that the metal content is obviously fairly close to that of a to genuine the red, coin. Yeah. The outer yellow ring of a genuine £2 coin also contains the metal zinc. The fakers have even managed to get that into their fake. We've got nickel, copper and 14.2% zinc, so we've got the added element there now which wasn't in the middle part which is obviously the zinc so a really good quality fake all the figures are fairly close to that of a genuine coin yeah very very close the fakers have cracked the royal mint by metallic safety measures if experts are having difficulty consumer have got no hope of being able to tell the difference we showed the results of our tests on the fake two pound coin to robert matthews a former assay master of the royal mint this is certainly the best £2 counterfeit that I've seen. Robert's concerned about the implications of the huge amount of effort that's gone into this fake £2 coin. It is worrying that this counterfeit and the alloys used point to a sophistication which tends to point towards uh, organised crime being used. Once organised crime is started to get involved, we are going to have more and more of a problem. We reported our discovery of this sophisticated fake £2 coin to the Royal Mint. They told us they ensure every effort is made to reduce the number of forgeries entering circulation. They also told us that forgers would require a highly sophisticated press to produce bicolour coins. Difficult to produce, but they are being produced in their thousands. Recently, over 550,000 bimetallic euro coins were seized in the port of Naples on the way from Shanghai. 
experts are worried that shipments of similar £2 fakes could be arriving on our shores. The £2 counterfeiting is entering a new stage and this should be tackled now, whether it means changing the coin, we need to be thinking seriously now about uh, how to increase the security of the £2 coin. Coming up, we go back in time to see the fake collectible coins that are also duping members of the public. Children's chairs are hugely popular, especially when they feature favourite film and cartoon characters like this one. They're in homes up and down the country, but you wouldn't want your child to settle down and watch TV or read a book in this. Safety claims on the chair's label are fake. This could put your home and family in danger. The authorities have been battling for years to take dangerous furniture with fake fire safety labels out of shops. Furniture like this puts homes and lives at risk. But now the fakers are targeting children with colourful but dangerous chairs that fail to meet flammability standards. Phil Sodaquest and his team from Northumberland Trading Standards have made worrying discoveries during recent raids of local shops. Here we have um, the chairs that we have actually seized to date. We have Peppa Pig, there are various coverings here from Toy Story, all intended to be attractive for smaller children, young children within the household. They give the customer the impression that they are a genuine product, when in reality they are a fake product. Phil's team discovered some obvious flaws with these fake children's chairs. There were no manufacturer's details or batch numbers on the labels. It would be a legal requirement for that batch number to be present. We can then identify from the batch number the exact location, date it was manufactured. But within this particular label, there is no provision or there's no inclusion of the information regarding the batch itself. So we would view this label to be illegal when fitted to this piece of furniture. Northumberland Trading Standards were concerned about the safety of the fake chairs, so they sent some for testing. But 400 miles further south on the Isle of Wight, Gemma Evans had found a similar children's chair online. She planned to buy it as a gift for her two-year-old daughter, Abigail. I was um, pregnant again, and so I wanted Abigail to have a, a special something for her. I saw the chair online and um, it looked like a really pretty little armchair. It looked comfortable and sweet and pink, which she loves. Gemma went ahead and bought the chair for £40. But the chair that arrived wasn't what she'd expected. The material doesn't fit very well. All the wadding up here is all very lumpy and bumpy and it just doesn't fit the chair at all. And it's all quite loose here, the picture on the internet shows Minnie Mouse there in a lovely design, but it's all cut, like, the main Minnie Mouse picture there is all cut off. And on closer inspection, Gemma became concerned about the safety of the chair. When I first opened it up, I straight away noticed all the uh, staples that are down here that are exposed, all the way across the top, both sides. And if she was to get something in there, she could pull one of those out and cut herself. You know, they shouldn't be exposed like that. And on the arms of the chair here, there's hardly any padding at all. It's really hard. And if she was to fall against that, she'd hurt herself quite a lot, I think. Back at Northumberland Trading Standards, further tests had revealed that the safety claims on the labels of the chairs they'd seized were fake. Whilst the labels honestly stated that the cover fabric was not match resistant, they claimed the chairs were safe from fire due to the presence of an interliner. It states that it meets the requirements of the 1988 safety regulations by inclusion of a fire resistant interliner. An interliner is a specific product manufactured to be flame retardant to reduce the spread of flame. When we peel back the layers on this chair itself, you'll see there is no interliner present in the construction of this chair. Concerned about the lack of interliner beneath the cover fabric, Trading Standards decided to carry out a standard match test 
that furniture has to pass to meet the UK's legal fire regulations. After setting the chair alight, the flames should self-extinguish within two minutes. One minute in, the fire has taken hold. This is a very worrying event in that the outer material, the cover fabric itself is not flame retardant. It supports combustion. That combustion leads to a major fire. Two minutes in, and then beyond the legal time limit, the flames continue to rage out of control. The manufacturers have clearly disregarded all of the safety requirements in producing furniture, and we can quite clearly see the consequences here. From this, this has become a very significant fire, which could have been in anybody's house, because the manufacturers have placed counterfeit goods on the market and are putting lives at risk by doing so. We showed the results of trading standards tests on their fake sofas to Gemma Evans, who'd bought a similar fake chair for her two-year-old daughter, Abigail. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe it just went up so quickly. And it's just two minutes, gone, that's it, nothing left. Nothing at all. Just wire mesh. I feel really angry that I've been lied to, basically. I feel sick to my stomach that that's in my house and that she could be sat on that chair and anything could happen, um, that she's in that danger with, that, with just a simple armchair. As trading standards continue to investigate the source of their fake chairs, Gemma has her own plans for her daughter's fake. The more I think about the chair, the more I just, I want it out of my house. I just, I hate it now. I just want it out. Earlier, we saw how sophisticated fake two pound coins are fooling consumers and experts alike. This is certainly the best £2 counterfeit that I've seen. But the fakers aren't just targeting modern coins. Now they're cashing in on collectible coins. Famous finds like the Staffordshire Gold Hoard in 2009 and a recent discovery of ancient coinage worth over half a million pounds in Buckinghamshire have reignited interest in collectible coins. Avid collector Richard thought he'd found a rare Celtic coin for sale online. The coin itself is about 2,000 years old, made about 50 years either side of the birth of Christ. I didn't know the dealer, but he'd sold 2,000 coins previously on eBay, so he was obviously an experienced dealer. Richard went ahead and spent over £300 for the coin, which was advertised as ancient Celtic. But on closer inspection, Richard realised something was wrong. When I, I got my viewing glass out, I looked very carefully and very in detail. There was the sort of unevenness and the suggestion of one or two bubbles in places. I was absolutely convinced it was a fake. So he sent the coin off to one of the UK's leading experts in Celtic coinage. The expert said the coin had very poor detail. He said that the colour of the gold was unconvincing and there were a few very small scratches. He said that the scratches looked recent and were designed to look like plough scratches. So everything was wrong. Fortunately, Richard eventually got his money back. But one of Britain's leading coin dealers, Nigel Mills, knows of others who haven't been so lucky. As a representative of the coin industry's trade body, the British Numismatic Trade Association, or BNTA, he's concerned about the growing number of fake collectible coins now being sold on the internet. I think the collecting market is having a real issue with fakes online because you close down one website and another two spring up. Nigel patrols the internet to hunt down sellers of fake collectible coins and shares his evidence with the auction sites that the fakers are using. There's quite a few coins on this site that are suspect and it's one of the sites that we are monitoring at the moment. Uh, we've seen quite a few fakes being uh, sold on here. It's not long before Nigel finds a suspect Roman coin that's advertised as dating from around 200 AD. This looks like a fake of a silver denarius of Commodus. It's got all the signs of being uh, a modern reproduction. 
you've got a raised pimple here, blurry design, and uh, no detailing. But the fakers aren't only targeting ancient collectible coins. Specialist auctioneers are also finding modern fakes too, some supposedly worth thousands of pounds. Auctioneer Christopher Webb keeps a collection of the latest fake coins in what's commonly known as a black museum. This is an interesting counterfeit. It is a genuine South African Kruger pond of 1898, but it has had a false 99 stamped on the bottom, which is a very rare issue. An original would be £32,000. This forgery is only worth about £250. But the biggest number of fakes seem to be coming from the Far East. And even low-value items are being targeted, like this Victorian half-crown. A genuine one is not particularly valuable, possibly in this condition, 20 or 30 pounds. Here we have the Chinese copy. The detail on the forgery is really quite good. The forgers have managed to replicate even the patina, the colour of the old coin. With fake coins like this mainly being sold online, Fake Britain wanted to see how easy it was to get hold of one. We found this silver denarius listed as being from around 200 AD and took it back to Roman coin specialist Nigel Mills. I don't like the overall colour and, in fact, this particular coin that's been chemically treated, subjected to dirt being applied into the recesses of the detail to make out that it's a recent find. Very clever. Would fool a lot of people. But I have no hesitation in suggesting that this is a modern forgery. But it's when the coin is weighed that its true nature is confirmed. Roman denarii are very precise in their weight. So this should be around 3.1 grams, and it's light. It's nearly 2.8 grams. It is 10% lighter than it should be. That would not be the case. And when a genuine Roman denarius coin is put alongside the fake, the differences are clear to see. Comparing the coins side by side, you can clearly see the difference in quality, particularly on the beard and the hairlines. They're much sharper on the genuine example. If you bought this coin, you'd be spending good money on bad. For a genuine Caracalla denarius in this quality, you'd expect to pay 35 to 40 pounds. This forgery is only worth a pound as a novelty item. Nigel has some words of advice for collectors buying coins online. The best thing to do is to either go to a coin show where you'll see a whole selection of dealers selling products or go to a British Numismatic Trade Association dealer and see what the originals look like. And then you can compare them to the items that perhaps you found online, but do be careful. That's all from Fake Britain. Goodbye.